All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Um, hopefully you got some food and pizza. Um, tonight we have Bill Carwin, um, author of SQL Anti-Patterns and probably some other stuff, but I don't remember your history, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, Aaron, as usual, uh, does the great job of getting all the speakers, and I kind of tag along for the ride frequently. Um, the announcement I always forget, can you turn off your cell phones? Um, we usually have one, but this time, reminder, so good. Um, in December, we have December 14th booked. Uh, it's going to be someone from per Vadim from Vadim. Vadim from Percona talking about MySQL 5.1 and 5.5. Right, Ryan? Okay, well. It's about moving from 5.0 to 5.1, since 5.0 will be officially dead. I guess it already is. And so the, there's all these new configurations in um, 5.1, and especially for InnoDB, and I don't know how many of you have set up uh, a 5.0 InnoDB, and you take the defaults, and the server runs like crap. So I'm sure with these new settings, it's going to be the same thing. If you take the default, it'll run like crap. So Vadim's going to come in and set us straight, and he's also going to give us some teasers about 5.5 and why we really want to get to 5.1 right away so that we're ready to go to 5.5 when it goes GA because it's going to be a performance release increase that's going to be incredible. And so, and Vadim's a little bit of a rock star in the, those of you that follow the benchmark blogging, <coughs> MySQL world, he does a lot of benchmarks. So it's pretty exciting he's going to be here next month. And then yeah. should I say who's in January? We have January? Yeah, yeah, I got January book. Uh, January, they're having some big conference. It may be an Oracle thing. And Lenz Grimmer, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, he's in, from Germany, and he speaks a lot on HA and Cluster. Those of you that are regulars know that we have not had a person come talk about Cluster. So um, he talks regularly about my SQL Cluster, so we're going to get him in to talk to us about that. Um, I don't know about you all, but I've been following Cluster for, God, four years. And it feels like right now it's really stabilized, and it has a great use, and it would be great to have someone talk to us about Cluster. So we're, we're only booked through January. Rolling back to Percona real quick. As usual, they're one of our sponsors. They provide all the yummy food and pizza, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, other sponsors is GameSpot.com and CBS Interactive. Facilities, obviously, um, some of the sodas we're hiring. Uh, not specifically GameSpot, but CBS Interactive as a whole, it's CNET, BNET, uh, Money Watch, CBS Sports, TV.com. There's just a bajillion different sites that we have. But uh, Patricia in the back, um, if you have any questions, hit her up real quick. Or there's some flyers in the back to pick up. There's some random pens and other little things. So help yourself. Um, if you have any questions during or after, what do you prefer? I love questions during. We can, you know, just raise your hand and I'll call on you and I'll repeat the question for the recording and, and then yeah. we'll, we'll do the, uh, and see what we can get through. All right. And our last sponsor is O'Reilly. Um, <clears throat> they were able to send us some nice copies of Bill's book, which he will be signing and auctioning off at some point. <laughs> and uh, from there, Aaron, did you have any other announcements? Um, yeah, I was going to open it to the floor. If, uh, Anyone has any announcements? You're hiring, you're looking for a job, you know, et cetera. Ryan, do you want to say Percona Spiel? Percona is hiring. Uh, we're looking for a biofuel performance expert. So we can talk about it here. Uh, Anyone else? Great. So, I turn the floor over. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Bill Carwin. I, uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, today. Uh, I'm going to talk about SQL injection today, and we're going to go pretty far in depth to this. This uh, group probably knows quite a bit about it. Uh, this talk is usually targeted toward developers, uh, but uh, either you'll find some things in here that's interesting to you, or you'll find some good arguments to use with your developers to get them to go on the straight and narrow. I've been a software developer for about 20 years. Um, uh, I've also been answering questions on SQL-related topics for about 15 years. Uh, 
way back in the dawn of time, I worked for Borland on their Interbase RDBMS product, uh, and I was doing technical support and training and writing the documentation for that product uh, until about 1999. After that, I was using MySQL. Uh, so I've been using MySQL for about 10 or 11 years now and spent a lot of time on the MySQL forums for several years there, answered a few thousand questions. And from there, I started becoming really a fan of Stack Overflow. So you may see me on Stack Overflow answering a lot of SQL questions. I think I'm the only person with the badge for database design on uh, earning enough points through database design on Stack Overflow currently. And I've last couple of years, I've been writing a book uh, basically collecting all the most frequent questions that I have answered over the years on SQL topics and doing a, a thorough treatment of each one of them to try to identify the, the sort of heavy hitters or the common blunders that people make with their uh, SQL development. The book is also targeted toward developers. And that's now come out this year in about June, and it's doing rather well. Uh, very happy with that. And I'm actually thinking of doing another one. So what I'm going to talk about today is SQL injection, which is a security topic. And as I researched this topic, I started to realize that SQL, a security topic like SQL injection is perhaps the number one thing that every person responsible for a database or a database-driven application should educate themselves about, even before things like data modeling and performance. Because the implications of uh, a flaw in a security model are pretty dire. And I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But first, let me uh, identify what is SQL injection. Probably most of us in this room know, but just so we're all on the same page. When we program in dynamic SQL, that is, we're, pre we're preparing a query to run as a string, or a, a string to, to be interpreted as an SQL query, we often find that some of our application data, some of our logic and, and uh, variables in our application code, needs to be in, interpolated into the string of the query, and then executed at runtime. This is distinct from the really old days when uh, static SQL was part of applications, and you would use a precompiler to, to uh, generate the code for that. But it's pretty much de rigueur today to use dynamic <coughs> SQL and here's an example of using PHP to interpolate a request variable directly into the string of your uh, uh, query, which we get from user input directly from a uh, web application uh, parameter. And the problem with this, as we've probably all seen, is that sometimes the format of the that input can be something that we didn't intend. It can be something that either by accident or by malicious attack, has introduced new content into your application and resulted in the query running in a way that you did not intend. So what, what about this example? In this case, somebody was clever and they uh, modified the, the format. Instead of just being a simple integer, they allow a whole SQL expression, which when interpolated into the query, changes the condition that the query applies to, and now we're going to read every uh, row from our, data, or from our database table instead of just the one that corresponds to the, the primary key that was we were looking for. So that's clearly not what we intended, but maybe it's not so bad. We get more rows instead of just one. But let's take a look at a different example where we're doing updating of data. If we have a couple of variables that get interpolated into this uh, uh, update statement to change my password, I'm going to uh, use both of these variables, assume both of these variables came from request input in, a, in an application. And one of them has a quoted string that we don't know what the content of that is, and the other one is supposed to be an integer. So what could go wrong here? Well, somebody could cleverly form the content of those request variables and do two things. One is they can form the uh, updates so that you're setting two columns instead of just one column. And they can also 
make this apply to every row in the table. So what would this do? It would set me, not only change my password, but it would set me to the an administrator role for this account, and it would apply to every row in the table. So with this type of attack, I could manipulate your application into making me, not only me the administrator and changing my password, but changing all the account's passwords so that I can log into any account. These are just uh, two different examples. Either one of them would be bad, uh, but that's what I mean by SQL injection. Again, sometimes this is by accident. Sometimes it's not an intentional attack on your application. It's just somebody formed a, uh, an input that was not what you expected. It isn't a simple integer, or it has a quote in the middle of it, which upsets the uh, string termination. But if it's, un if it's an accidental error, it's more likely just to generate a parse error than something uh, uh, malicious and clever. It does happen, though, that uh, hackers who are trying to gain illicit access to your ac account can do this cleverly and break in. OK, so that's the foundation. That's, that's sort of the what is SQL injection. So how do we defend against this? This is our responsibility as developers or database administrators to try and find out what are the ways that we can defend against this and I see a lot of uh, people suggesting uh, fixes for this. And I'm going to try to address a bunch of the comments and, and uh, uh, observations that people have about this condition or SQL injection threats and phrase them in terms of here's what people say and here's the uh, relative mer uh, merit, the truth or falsehood of it. So one thing you might hear, SQL injection that's, that's been around for years. That's an old problem. Somebody must have come up with a, a fix for that by now. Well, in fact, it's, it's such an old problem that it's a favorite problem of hackers. And the, the big example that happened a couple of years ago was that a man named Albert Gonzalez used SQL injection to hack into ATM systems at a number of convenience stores in order to upload some um, malware that he wrote to monitor network traffic. And what's a network traffic in an ATM system? It's credit card numbers and debit card numbers. So he was capturing uh, authorized credit card numbers and their, uh, their PIN numbers at an ATM system, saving that off and shipping the data off to uh, some colleagues of his in Russia. And he broke the record of most uh, credit card numbers uh, stolen in this way, tripled the previous record, in fact, which he himself already was the perpetrator of. So he's going for a personal best, I guess. So he did this in 2007. He was sentenced for 20 years in March 2010. Uh, an example of the impact of this is one of the victim companies had to pay upwards of $12 million to uh, fix this uh, problem, just for fines and uh, to compensate people who had been victimized. Then on top of that $12 million, they had to fix all of their code, code inspections and rewrites and redeployments and so on. And they were only one of the victim companies of two or three companies. Other cases of SQL injection, these are no, by no means exhaustive, but uh, these are just ones I picked out of Wikipedia. But clearly, 2008, 2009, they're, they're still going on. And they're, the impact is pretty dire. Uh, in the thousands, tens of thousands, millions of compromised uh, records of your database that uh, perpetrators of SQL injection can gain access to. And Verizon Business Risk Team did a report on uh, data breaches and found that SQL injection is the probably the number one or number two, depending on how you count it, method for uh, breaking into databases and it accounts for the majority of the actual data compromised. So clearly this is still an ongoing problem and we have to be aware of it. So what do people do to get around this, to defend against it? One answer you often hear is escaping input prevents SQL injection. That's probably the, the most frequent uh, solution that people have and I'll show you an example. 
if we were to have our uh, update statement that I showed earlier, <clears throat> but we were just uh, conscious of the fact that the string we interpolate into that query could contain a mismatched quote character, and we make sure to escape that quote character with a backslash. And likewise, when the uh, where clause needs to have a dynamic integer interpolated into it, if we make sure that that input is only an integer by stripping off anything that doesn't look like an integer, for example, or coercing it by data type, that ought to handle it. So we insert the backslash. We make sure we coerce to an uh, integer. And in PHP, for an example, there are functions to do this that are built into the API methods for MySQL. MySQL real escape string uh, does that. Any uh, text that you hand that, it'll come back in a form which is safe to interpolate into a quoted string. And the other example I use here is a uh, typecast to make sure that the other variable is uh, coerced into being a simple integer. By the way, uh, folks who are taking notes, these slides will be available online. So if you, if, uh, you prefer one of the other MySQL uh, APIs in PHP, like PDO, there are similar functions there too. The PDO one is nice. I like that one because it actually puts the quotes on to delimit the string as well. So sounds great, right? This is uh, an effective defense against uh, those types of interpolating dynamic variables in. What about other cases? If you want to do a, a query that treats as dynamic um, the column by which to sort. So you want to have an order by clause with user input to determine which column is going to be used for the order and whether it's ascending or descending. What do you do there? Well, it turns out that those APIs don't have a function to uh, escape the content that gets uh, interpolated into a delimited column name. Columns are delimited by backticks in MySQL or double quotes in ANSI SQL, but that means you have to put a backslash in front of backticks or double quotes, and the escape string function doesn't do that. And likewise, if you are interpolating dynamic application variables into your SQL string that need to become treated as SQL keywords, like ascending or descending, those don't have delimiters at all. There's no backticks, there's no single quotes, there's no double quotes. They have to be bare words in your SQL string. So how do you protect against that? And there's no way to uh, ensure that that is uh, uh, escaped. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to try to escape that because you, you're not uh, finding any quotes to imbalance or any uh, backslashes and so on. So although escaping the strings is helpful, it doesn't account for all these cases. Another thing that I hear uh, developers say a lot is, if, so, if some escaping is good, more must be better. This sort of goes along with the general American attitude toward the economy. So you see things like this. So they, they said, well, my SQL real scrape string was good. I'm going to wrap that around my password. But there's all these other functions in PHP that do similar things. I'm going to use them all because more defense is better, right? Well, now you end up with backslashes or before your backslashes and uh, things encoded in HTML entity tags uh, and so on, which is totally inappropriate for inserting into the database. It makes no sense in SQL syntax to have ampersand LT semicolon, which would be a good defense if you were outputting this to HTML output from a web application, but makes no sense if you're trying to encode something in an insert statement or an update statement. What I, I think when I see developers post uh, code like this is the scene from the recent Star Trek movie where the villain says, fire everything at the Enterprise. Like, if, if one thing is good, then the rest must be better. And I have to tell them, just use the function that is intended for that purpose. That's enough as long as you use it consistently and it's the appropriate function to use. OK, moving on. What else do you hear? I can write my own escaping function. Why is this uh, a myth or a fallacy? 
people say, well, putting backslashes in front of things is something I can do with uh, a regular expression replace function. That, that's uh, pretty ordinary, right? But it turns out uh, that one of the attributes of a MySQL connection to a database is a character set. And you can have multi-byte character sets. You get into situations that are uh, a little esoteric, uh, but do occur, where a backslash followed by the quote character can be interpreted as a multi-byte character in the uh, character set that you're using, which can now mean that you have, again, imbalanced quotes. So something simple like add slashes, which is not aware of the character set that you're using, may seem convenient for a developer to use. But please don't do that. It's not character set aware. I have a couple links in here that are too small to read on the slides, but you can follow them later when you have access to the slides that go to blogs that ex explain in excruciating detail the way that this actually works. And it's not necessary to use these. You don't need to write your own function. You can use the functions that are provided in the API for MySQL. Every uh, language and every library to access MySQL has something like this, the MySQL real escape string or an equivalent. And those do go back to the MySQL client to get information about the connection character set, and it does the appropriate thing. So no need to reinvent that wheel. All right, next up, something I hear. Well, unsafe data comes from users. If I've already taken care to make sure something gets inserted into my database safely, <coughs> then it must be safe for subsequent use in an SQL statement. For example, if I'm uh, doing a full text search uh, looking for mentions of a, a given product in my bug database, for example, I might fetch that product name in one query and then interpolate it into a subsequent query to match it. But what if the name of the product itself contains a quote or other special characters? You could run into an SQL injection uh, problem inadvertently here or deliberately. Somebody may have uh, logged a product name deliberately containing mismatched quotes and SQL syntax hoping to do this kind of onesie-twosie uh, attack. It seems a little far-fetched, but it actually does happen. So in this case, it would have been adequate to use, again, MySQL real escape string to make sure that that product name, even though it was safely in the database, gets treated as though it is untrusted input in the subsequent second query. Next up, a lot of people say, just use store procedures for everything. That, that's a, a gateway that will create a, a secure situation for you, and there's no way anybody can break through that. How many people have heard this or said it themselves? Well, it is true that in a uh, stored procedure, the SQL queries are more or less static. You can determine the query syntax at the time that you write the procedure. And you also have situations where a uh, input goes through effectively a, a coercion to a data type because you know you, you can only have integers come in if your input parameter is an integer. So it should be safe, right? Well, you can also do dynamic SQL in stored procedures. You can use prepare and execute and start concatenating together strings and create an unsafe query inadvertently. So in this case, I may want to, again, have my order by column be dynamic. So the column name and the ascending versus descending is determined by a string, which comes from I don't know where. And then as I execute that uh, in my application, I can interpolate unsafe input from a, a user request or some other source, uh, which the procedure doesn't know how to defend against. and you get SQL injection that way. There's even a great article on the daily WTF. <clears throat> what happened was a database administrator had a policy that everything must be gated through stored procedures. And if you need a new type of query, don't run the query against the database yourself. I, don't have, I haven't given you privileges to do that. 
tell me what your query is, I'll write a stored procedure, and then you, you, know, you can do that. Which w worked, except the DBA was a little annoyed at having to write new procedures every day for subtly different types of queries. Until one day when he finally said, well, I'll just write one query which dynamically inserts, interpolates the table name based on the string parameter of the procedure. And then you can query star from any table that you uh, need to uh, query from. Suddenly his phone calls went away, and he was happy. Because the developers figured out that they could pass a derived table in a, in a parenthesized subquery, and it would get interpolated into the procedure, and that way they could query any table that they wanted. So they didn't have to bother the DBA anymore. He was happy. They got to do anything they wanted to the database. They were happy. But here's a prime case where, as they uh, constructed this string in their application code before sending it to that procedure, they can make mistakes and interpolate unsafe data into their subquery, which they then go in. And nobody would know, because the DBA says, well, I'm not getting called anymore. I can, I can go home early. And the developers don't know how to defend against the uh, risks of SQL injection, so they're happy, and nobody ever does a code inspection. OK, next thing we hear is, well, everybody knows how to use grant and revoke. Just make sure that you haven't granted too many privileges to applications that don't need them. So if we don't let an application do an update against a given table, that'll uh, mitigate the damage that uh, can be caused. But what if I, as an attacker, can manipulate your application into running a query like this, doing a Cartesian product against, I don't know, the table six times over? So if you had 100 bugs in this table, now you've generated a result set of one trillion rows. And I'm feeling especially mean, so I'm going to throw an order by one on the end, causing a, a temporary table in your temp space to, to sort those one trillion rows. So it doesn't necessarily give me access to, do, to, gain, to steal your data, but I can certainly do a denial of service attack that way. I've even seen examples like this, where a request literally has verbatim SQL, a complete query, as a visible uh, parameter in the uh, get URL. So quite easy to manipulate that if I'm an attacker. What about another one? Well, this application is just on the intranet. There's, we're not going to have malicious attackers. Everybody here in the company is trusted, and they won't do that. They won't uh, change the request parameters of this intranet application. That might be true, but eventually you find yourself working for this guy. And he says, yeah, I'm going to have to ask you to open up that application because we have some partners who want to have access to it. And uh, just um, punch a hole through our firewall and let people run that application from outside. Which you can understand that if you haven't constructed your application carefully with SQL injection defense in mind, would result in a problem. Or if you don't open up the firewall, but somebody says, wow, you coded that application so well, I'm just going to copy a little bit of your code and put it into this other application, which is on outside the firewall, and hence uh, you know, take a, you know, get myself in trouble that way. Code reuse, it's a good thing, right? And the problem is, the real defense in those situations is, it's, is if you are asked to take some code that is not architected for safety and put it outside your firewall where it could be attacked, you say, well, we need to do a code inspection, and it'll take six to eight weeks to finish that. And the boss says, no, 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 that's too much expense. Just get it done. We have to make our, this accessible by our partners by 5 p.m. today. Next thing I hear, I use a framework. I use Ruby or PHP or Python, and the framework takes care of all my SQL injection defense. It's all taken care of. Or an uh, object relational mapper. But every object relational mapper library or framework that I've used 
or seen allows for exception cases where the uh, framework doesn't handle some sophisticated or corner case of SQL. So their solution is, well, we'll just let the developer pass a fragment of SQL that contains verbatim uh, logic. And that's where your SQL injection can get in. Anytime you can have a developer who is writing a string, which then gets interpolated into an SQL query, you can get into trouble. And what I realized is no framework and no library can take care of you all the time. One user came up to me after one of these presentations and, and uh, asked me, uh, can the, the database framework that you're using prevent SQL injection? And I told him, the framework prevents SQL injection like a toothbrush cures cavities. You have to use it consistently and correctly and make sure that you know what you're doing. But a framework can give you tools and convenient methods if you use them. But ultimately, it's your responsibility, and that's why I'm giving this talk, is to try to reinforce that, that the developer is responsible for application security. No framework can do that for you all the time. OK, so what's next up? What's the next defense that we can uh, use for SQL injection? Query parameters. This is the other thing that I hear or, or see in articles and blogs. Just use query parameters all the time, and you'll be protected. What am I talking about here? Well, in, I've used the word interpolating when we actually copy a string into a, into a string to form our SQL query. And this is a typical uh, way of using an application. What developers then learn as sort of as they get more seasoned is that you can use what's called a parameter, which is a placeholder in your SQL string in lieu of the dynamic value from your application. And then subsequently, you can provide the value to uh, uh, in place of that placeholder. Let's go into a little bit more detail about this. So this is how the RDBMS might look at, at your query after it's decomposed it into its syntactic elements and represented it inside the uh, optimizer of the database. It's broken that down into the different clauses of the SQL uh, in abstract syntactic elements and then mapping directly to the literals that you uh, had or identifiers that you had. And you can see the yellow bubble at the bottom, that's where the uh, query parameter belongs. And it says, I know what a query parameter is. I'm going to record that in my parse tree uh, for later in, uh, inclusion because I know that the user is going to provide me a value before I have to actually execute this uh, query. And when you provide the value, then the database says, substitute that value in, just in that little yellow bubble, and it'll execute it uh, as though you had interpolated it from the beginning. But it's better than interpolation, because if you were to use interpolation, what happens is the uh, it goes into the database before the parsing occurs. And hence, the database says, well, it must, the tree must look like this. The, uh, the parse tree must, must look like this, because that's the string I got from your uh, user input. But it's a different shape now. This is how SQL injection modifies the logic or the, the semantics of the query by changing the shape of this uh, parse tree before it gets to the, the database. If you had used a parameter, the parameter belongs in its own little bubble that gets determined as the database parses it. And it, no matter what value you give it subsequently, it knows that that's only one syntactic element in that parse tree, so it cannot break outside that. It cannot modify the size or shape of the tree. And therefore, it can't modify the behavior or the semantics of how it runs that query. Let me show this in a different way to go over it uh, in, in a sequence diagram. If you have a client and a server, a client is an application, the server is your RDBMS, and you do a prepare of this query, including the parameter placeholder, the question mark that I showed, you send that SQL string to the server 
where it gets parsed and turned into that internal representation with the knowledge that part of it is a placeholder. At that point, the database can say, OK, I'm going to, now that I know which tables you're accessing and how you're sorting and doing all these other things, I can optimize. I can decide in what order I'm going to access the tables. I can decide which indexes are going to apply to your query. And I'm going to keep note of that. The next thing you do is execute the query. At this point, you provide the values that belong in each of the pr uh, parameter placeholders that you've provided. The RDBMS knows, oh, I now I'm binding some values into those parameter placeholders and finally execute the query and give you your results back. The nice thing about this is it has not interpolated the values that you gave into a string representation of the query. It's, in, it's combined them with this internal binary or this, this uh, parse tree representation. So now it knows how to put different values into the same place. It, it has not lost its place, and it can substitute different values. Yeah? Um, uh, not so much about ORMs. Yeah. Sorry about this. Yeah, I try to keep the, the code examples in the slides really uh, simple and language independent because where this uh, topic applies to multiple languages and multiple frameworks and, and ORMs, it, you know, it's useful to try to make it as uh, reusable as possible. Sure. Ready to resume? So all this detail given, this is a way that we can think of uh, query parameters as being better than interpolating dynamic variables into our SQL strings in that uh, we don't have to do escaping. We don't have to worry about uh, encoding issues for different character sets. We don't have to worry about coercing uh, data types. We know that none, nothing a malicious or accidental uh, input can do can change the semantics of the query that we run. So it sounds good, right? This is this is why you see people on blogs and magazines say query parameters, just use them all the time. So they say query parameters prevent SQL injection, full stop. But there's some other cases. Because one parameter in the SQL language corresponds to one value. It, you can use a parameter in a place where you could otherwise have used one literal value and nothing else. So for example, you can't do it in a place where you would use multiple values, like in an in clause, where you would have a, a comma separated list of uh, individual integers. The one parameter would allow you to put in a uh, value but it would get mapped to one value in the uh, query. It would not be equivalent to having a string of uh, values. You can't use a parameter to substitute for a table or any other uh, identifier like a column. Again, these parameters can substitute only in a place where you would normally use a single string literal, an integer, a quoted string, a quoted date literal, and so on. And likewise, it cannot be substituted for a, an SQL keyword. Yes? Uh, your question is, your understanding is that prepare happens on the client side. Uh, not currently. Usually, it, it does 
ship the string to the server, and there the parser recognizes it and uh, stores it in, in the uh, server side. That's my understanding. So you're saying the prepare statement was very, very fast. And, and uh, well, all, you think of it, all the, the only thing the prepare has to do is send a string over the network to your database where it is parsed and then saved. It hasn't actually done any I.O. to access your database table. It's only analyzed the query string and remembered, OK, when I get around to executing it, here's what I'm going to have to do. Now I know uh, how to optimize it. I know which indexes I may use. But it has, hasn't actually done that yet. So it, it should be a fairly quick operation and is uh, not scaled to the size of your database table because it's not actually accessing the data yet. It'll do that after you execute. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so back to summary. The different cases where you might use a uh, dynamic portion of your uh, SQL, trying to substitute for a single value. There you can use either interpolation or a parameter. Multiple values, you can have a string with integers and commas in it, for example, and interpolate that into an SQL string. But if you needed to use parameters, you would have to use one parameter placeholder for each value in your list. When your, your list could be of variable size, so you might have to uh, use some built-in functions to your application code to decide how many question marks to put in there and then match that to the, the length of your list. But table names, column names, and other keywords, for example, whole expressions or, or uh, SQL keywords, you can't use query parameters for those. So what do we do? Well, the solution that I use is, I call it whitelist maps. And I have an uh, example in PHP again. Say we had a our uh, uh, variable sorting query that I showed in the examples earlier. And I want uh, a couple of web parameters, order and dir for direction, to indicate how I'm going to do that. The SQL injection way would be to just take the inputs directly out of my uh, web request and interpolate those into the SQL query. But that, as we've seen, results in an SQL injection vulnerability. What I would rather do is make sure that those are valid inputs for the given query before I interpolate them in. Again, I can't use parameters because these are table names and SQL keywords. So let's take a look at what I do. I have a couple of associative arrays in PHP. The keys of the associative array are going to be the uh, uh, values that are given on the uh, request. The values of the associative array are the actual values or portions of SQL syntax that I'm then going to interpolate into the query. And I have some, some defaults at the end in case those parameters aren't specified on a given request. So how do we use this? We have the uh, uh, request uh, variable order gets tested to see if, if that occurs in the keys of my associative array. And if so, then use the value in the associative array, which I know that I wrote and I determined, so I know it's safe to use. It's the name of the column that corresponds to the, the uh, sort order. So we've mapped the user input on the web request to something that I've hard-coded, which is the name of a column, which also gives me an opportunity to make the, the code in the web request not be literally the name of the column. I can use anything I want. And you saw that in, in the, very similarly in the direction case, I didn't say ASC or DSC, DESC, ascending and descending. I used up and down. So now the keys in my associative array can be up, down, and they map to values ascending and descending, which kind of uh, 
is nice because I can abstract that away from the user. The user doesn't have to see little fragments of SQL uh, syntax in the web request. It, I can make it anything I want and, and protect them from having to see that. And then I can, after I've done that mapping, I can then use those values and interpolate them directly into my SQL query in a simple manner like this and know that they're safe to use because they came from code that I wrote. And the, the moral of the story that I often tell people or to sum up is say, let users specify data values. Don't let users specify code or any fragment of code, anything that would be interpolated into code. OK, so that's my solution for making dynamic parts of your query which cannot be either escaped or parameterized. Use the whitelist. The next thing I hear people say is, I don't like to use prepared queries. Queries with parameters are slow. I'm using, I'm going, you know, here's the, the logic. It stands to reason, and that's, that's uh, the first point where you know that uh, you're in trouble. It stands to reason that it will be slower because it involves two round trips from the client to the server. One to send the SQL string with the parameter placeholders in it, and the second one to make the uh, request to execute the query with the respective values on that uh, execution. Two requests must be more expensive than one. So I did some timings with MySQL and PHP. And you know PHP has three different uh, uh, APIs for using MySQL. Um, MySQL, MySQLi, and PDO MySQL. And the latter two also support prepared queries. The first one does not. So in this case, I have all those different cases, the plain MySQL API, MySQLi without using prepared queries, but just executing the query as uh, an immediate uh, execution versus preparing the uh, uh, query and, and then subsequently executing it with parameter values, and sim similarly with PDO. The gold bars indicate the profiled uh, execution according to set profiler in the MySQL engine and measuring milliseconds. The blue bars indicate the elapsed time. I started a timer running in my PHP script, prepare, execute, stop timer. So you can see that there's quite a bit of overhead, but it doesn't come from SQL nor MySQL. It comes from the overhead of the PHP language itself, executing a few functions to bind uh, variables into those prepared queries, and so on. But also notice, comparing the direct execute versus the prepared execute, the, the second, third, and fourth, fifth columns, uh, you can see that the, using a prepared query, the execution time actually goes down slightly, but uh, it's actually not a big problem for the RDBMS to prepare and execute a query or even if it was equal, or even if it was a little bit higher, it certainly kind of blows a hole in the argument that prepared queries are so slow that I don't want to use them. So this was a timer with a very, very simple query. It was just fetch me one row. I'm specifying the primary key value, and I just want to get that. It's about the fastest query you can run. So the relative uh, amount between the uh, the query and the PHP code to execute it is as large as possible. Question? I'm just curious, do you have MSQL ND? I believe I was using MySQL ND. So, because uh, I'm using PHP 5.3.4 and MySQL 5.1.40 something. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to do it as recent and up-to-date as possible without going to beta stuff. So that, that I believe that was using the MySQL ND driver. Okay, so simple query with a minimal amount of overhead in the RDBMS layer shows the delta between the uh, what the database has to do in terms of work versus the PHP application layer to the, much, the greatest degree possible. But what if the query is actually a bit more complex? So it actually takes more time to do some sorting and joining and doing other sort of complex things on the server side. Then the delta between the uh, 
the executing the SQL in the RDBMS versus the amount of time elapsed in the application is almost imperceptible. And both between, uh, sorry, this is beeping. Uh, both between the uh, uh, server side versus client side, and between prepared versus direct execution. But all this is really meant to only show that it should not be your criterion that prepared queries have a lot of overhead uh, and thus decide not to use them. The, their overhead is not that bad and the benefits are great. Okay, so myths and fallacies. I covered 12 myths and fallacies and tried to explain that some of them have a grain of truth, but uh, lead you to uh, wrong conclusions. But there's one other issue that I've added to this presentation recently, which is the assertion that no SQL databases are immune to SQL injection. Can't happen. We're not sending SQL, we're sending JavaScript MapReduce functions, or whatever. And this is, in a way, true, and sort of true by uh, uh, tautology, if it doesn't support SQL at all, then clearly you can't execute illicit SQL. But that's kind of cutting off your nose to spite your face. Or uh, treating a stubbed toe by cutting off your leg. So here's just sort of a mocked up version uh, or application executing a mapping function in JavaScript with MongoDB from PHP. And we submit the, the mapping function written in JavaScript as a string. This is the way you execute a mapping function from PHP in MongoDB. You concoct a string. What happens if the mapping function itself needs to be dynamic based on user input? Well, you interpolate some stuff into that JavaScript function. That's your code injection. SQL injection is a special case of a broader problem called code injection, where you're allowing untrusted input to become part of code which you then execute. It's the old problem that has existed forever with functions like eval or system. If you aren't careful about what you execute, now you're executing on your server with the privileges of the uh, process on your server. And if you uh, allow untrusted input, you can get yourself into trouble. So any time you are executing code with a you know, partial input from an untrusted it's an example of code injection. And while it isn't SQL injection, it's still dangerous. I'm, this was brought to light by a blog that came out recently, just in September. Uh, a fellow reported uh, that he had analyzed a, a popular Ruby on Rails application that showed some, ex some cases of uh, no SQL injection in an open source project. So if you're interested in, in uh, seeing the, the uh, nitty gritty on this, I'll let you follow that link once you download my slides. So it does happen. Oops. So thanks very much for listening to my talk. This is uh, one of the chapters in my book is about SQL injection. And you can feel free to check that out. I, I have posted a discount code for the uh, my, San Francisco MySQL meetup uh, that you can use. And we also have a raffle for three copies to give away tonight. And thanks very much. Slideshare.net, Bill Carwin. All right, Bill, I'm there. <laughs> I know you want to. So do you have things for DBAs versus developers? And how to, I mean, do I just use Mac to grab a bunch of queries and make sure that they're, they're not doing it? Because I don't even have the time to go through on the code to make sure they're doing bad things in the database. Okay, the question is about, are there any tools for DBAs to monitor and detect and inspect code to try to figure out if, if your de developers are doing things wrong? Uh, there's, there's a, uh, I'm not aware of any things like Matkit uh, that do that. There is a product called, I think, Green SQL which is, works like a proxy. And actually, at runtime, it monitors queries coming through and tries to find things that look like they might be suspect queries uh, based on, uh, I'm not sure if that's open source. 
and I haven't used it. So the, the uh, skepticism that I have about products like that, like green SQL, is that it may give you a sense, a false sense of uh, safety. That if you say, well, we have this proxy thing monitoring our SQL queries and trying to spot likely candidates, then we're safe. And we don't have to be uh, careful about our coding, and, and uh, we don't have to do inspections. Uh, but there's always the uh, hackers who sort of up the ante, and they try to find patterns of queries that not only exploit your database, but get through the filters. So I think, unfortunately, the only solution is to do code inspections with security and safety in mind. Basically, any time you have SQL that is being generated dynamically at runtime in your, in your applications, you have the possibility of SQL injection. So trying to uh, go through those, and it, it, it doesn't have to be a lengthy process. You just have to identify any dynamic content that's being interpolated into your queries. Uh, ask, where did that content come from? Did it come from a trusted source? and just quiz the developers. Make sure that you have either um, done proper escaping or quoting or parameterization or type coercion or whitelisting. Like many topics in security, there are multiple solutions that apply in different situations and you have to use all of them. Because if you have one weakness, that's where the attack will get through. Another question. Yeah, I got a question. The database schema itself is, is dynamic, meaning that uh, tables and columns might change throughout the uh, life cycle of the application. And basically, you outlined two, two approaches here. One is the whitelisting, which is a, a filtering approach, and then the other one is escaping your output to the database. Um, can you give any recommendation when it comes to the point where, uh, where the, the queries that are being constructed uh, contain... Uh, basically, there's there's logic applied to the construction of the table names and the columns, and uh, you you don't know you have to basically be able to to deal there with with arbitrary input input. Um, I had the case where we where we, what we were doing was we we're doing a, we we're looking into information schema to to retrieve information about the tables that we're about to query what columns they contain, and then we use those this information retrieved to to whitelist the input. Versus the other one is, just, you know, you, you double quote your your column names. Uh, is there? Any, do you have any preference um, regarding one approach over the other? Um. Uh, it's an interesting problem. I'm not going to repeat that whole thing because you were miked, and I assume that we can get that. In, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, that's an interesting problem. If you've got a schema that is so dynamic that you need the code to be able to handle uh, schema changes. Uh, which may occur after you've finished your code and you can't touch the code anymore to update your, your whitelists and, and so on. Um, uh, you could, for example, write a, a layer that inspects the information schema to get names of tables and columns and make sure that whatever's being passed in actually matches a, a legitimate table and column. Because if somebody is using, an attacker is using SQL injection to try to expand the uh, syntax and logic that it, your query is going to run, your, your table name is probably not one, two, three, four, or true with spaces in the middle. It, you know, maybe you should uh, make sure of that with some naming conventions for your project. Another uh, technique, if you don't want to do dynamic inspection of the information schema, because information schema is notoriously slow uh, to use at runtime, is have a process that as you uh, expand your schema and add new objects in the database, <coughs> have that process also generate um, code for whitelisting. So your application would look to a, a whitelisting layer that has generated uh, uh, based on the changes that you made to the database. And also, I, I think the last thing you mentioned was using delimited identifiers, using the double quotes or the back ticks to delimit table names and column names, which may contain special characters. And yes, do that too. But both, both in combination would be your recommendation. Both in combination, <coughs> yeah. I would I do that myself. I try to make sure to use delimited identifiers because I can't make sure that uh, the table names aren't going to contain special characters. 
or at least to free me up so that I can use special characters in the future. Here, another question? Christopher. If we need it. Um, can you just clarify your position on escaping input so that it gets stored verbatim in the database as the user entered it versus storing it with escaping in the database? Okay, let me make sure I understand what you mean. The uh, If I'm uh, storing input in the database uh, and I'm not using parameter squares, but I'm just using escaping methods, you can escape them as you insert them into the database, and then they're stored without the escaped uh, function. So the backslashes are essentially stripped out in the process of inserting them into the database. They're now verbatim what the user intended, unless you inadvertently double escaped. If you applied the escaping function twice, then you, you get backslashes into the strings that are actually stored in your database. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. And uh, I guess I was just trying to clarify, because I think that's sometimes a myth that some people have, is that they want to store it with escaping in the database. So I just wanted to see your position on that. I definitely think that you should not store it with escaping uh, applied, because you don't necessarily know what the usage of that string is going to be. If you uh, store it in the database, and then the next time you get it out, you're actually going to send it in an email, or display it in HTML, or use it in a subsequent SQL query, all of those demand different types of uh, subsequent output. So I would say apply the, the appropriate type of escaping at the time when you output the data from your application, and not before. Any other questions? Has anybody in here actually been uh, a, uh, a victim of SQL injection having applied to your... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I realize it's mostly a, a room of uh, people with, uh, you know, more database heavy, but um, my, my background, you know, I use ORMs a lot. So I was wondering if, if you could talk a little bit about some examples of uh, injection through ORMs. Like, is it only when you use... Um, okay, that was yours. <laughs> Unhappy think that. I am plugged into your laptop, so it's probably just... Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I think it's off. Maybe. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. So is it is it only when you use things like uh, in Hibernate, you know, HQL or in Doctrine does the same, uh, the the PHP ORM, right? Um, is it only when you put the the sort of intermediate languages, or is it also an issue when you have you know like a book object, like books dot find by author and then the name of the author if that's not escaped properly? Like, is that also a problem? Uh, so if you can talk through some of those examples, that would be super awesome. Sure. Uh, so we're asking about ORMs and when do ORMs do things right versus doing things wrong. Uh, most ORMs have been uh, constructed by experts who understand these issues, and they, they know that if, if you're doing an uh, abstracted type of lookup, you know, find by ID uh, type of lookup, it knows to uh, um, do the usual defense mechanisms escape by uh, uh, string or string escaping, coerce to integer if that's appropriate, use parameters if that's appropriate. Uh, so it does, most ORMs that are worth their salt do do that. I have seen other ORMs being put out there by people who are less expert, but they still say, look at me, I published my own ORM. And I look at their code and it's rife with uh, SQL injection vulnerabilities because they are not doing appropriate escaping and so on. So you, you, something like in Hibernate, I would hope that there's, there's been an army of developers looking at that and, and being very, very careful about that. And uh, likewise, something like Doctrine in the PHP world or Active Record in Ruby on Rails. But all of these ORMs, in addition to doing lookups by primary key or by uh, individual value of, of a uh, specified column, they often say, you know what, you can, you can do anything that we didn't provide for you as a convenience function. We're just going to let you do anyway by find by SQL. You know, and it just takes whatever string you give it and 
interpolates it verbatim into the uh, where clause of a, of a query and just runs it. And it trusts you that you have constructed that string correctly. And then it becomes your responsibility. So, and I, and I've, I haven't seen any ORMs that don't provide some uh, mechanism like this of just saying, and everything else. Every other type of query that you might want to run, we're going to let you, and now it's, it's your, uh, your responsibility to do it in a secure manner. We can't apply uh, escaping if what you're providing is a full SQL expression with multiple terms and Boolean operators and function calls and everything else. How do you apply escaping to that? And clearly you can't apply uh, parameters to that because it's a whole expression. You can't, you know, I, you can only use a parameter for a single value. And you can't use whitelisting for that because you, there's too many cases you, you, to, to whitelist. So it has to become the developer's responsibility for cases like that. Uh, I would I would expect that a, a reputable ORM library has been uh, developed with security in mind, and although uh, it would be worth making sure of that, you know you could you could do some experiments yourself. Try to s put yourself with your your black hat on and see if you can um, get it to uh, create some malformed SQL by giving it creative column names and so on, or uh, strings with quotes in them. Um, and sometimes those cases can be very subtle and hard to track down. So it, even if there is a vulnerability in an ORM, it, it may take some work to try to satisfy yourself that it's uh, truly safe to use. Would, uh, would adding whitelisting on top of all those other techniques be overkill? Not necessarily. Uh, uh, the, I, the subject of security is touchy because, as I said, the, the strength of it is only that of its weakest link. And you, you know, if you have an application that is exposed to the outside world, you have to make sure that there's absolutely no way, no corner case or, or slim uh, uh, situation where untrusted input can be interpreted as code. And that can be very challenging. Fortunately, you know, if you whittle it down, most of the cases of, of user input coming into an application are going to be treated as values. So it's very uh, easy to use escaping or parameterization in those cases. It's only the, the corner cases where you are taking in SQL expressions and exotic things and column names and SQL keywords that you need to be especially careful. But hopefully that's a, a small minority of your total code base. It's not like you have to do exhaustive testing and inspection on all 300,000 lines of code in your project. You may only need to do it in 5% of the cases where you have uh, SQL queries that are that sophisticated and that custom. Thank you. I think you are first over here, and I'll get to you. Thanks. Um, so on the subject of overkill, I'm wondering if it's possible that you might create a system where you have escaped your escaping. Um, and this is getting back at his question about whether it's overkill to do uh, that kind of escaping of an ORM. Is that something that you've run into, or do you have a thought on that? Definitely, yes. It, it, it's possible to do that. Because if you're a developer who says, well, escaping is good, so I'm going to escape my values before I hand them off to the ORM, not realizing that the ORM is also coded to use either escaping or parameterization. Now that's a very easy way for these multiple layers of abstraction to interact in a way that results in uh, strings containing backslashes because they were double backslashed to creep into your uh, uh, database. And now you have uh, a mess because some of your data got into the database uh, in a conventional way and some of it got double escaped and which is which, and uh, you have to sort that out in application code. A lot of the ORMs don't, the developers I know who work with Hibernate say, I don't know what my query is. Exactly. That's another, pro, you know, in, oh, you know, go ahead and repeat, repeat the question. 
<laughs> down. So one of my experiences is with developers who are using like Hibernate, they go, I don't know what my query is. You tell me. Right, unless you enable logging. If you actually have a tail minus F on your general query log and, and uh, are making sure that you're monitoring what the actual queries that get uh, sent to the I mean, you could, I use MacKit for that, and that's how I do it at the D. But I shouldn't have to do that in production is what I feel, is that they should know how to do that. Right. Yeah, I, I worked a bit on the uh, Zend framework, which is a, a popular PHP uh, ap application, and I worked on the database components of that. And we had um, a, one function in there called a profiler, which would allow you to see how long it's taking for your queries. But the other thing that it gave you is an ability to see what the actual queries that were executed under any number of layers of abstraction and ORM, it would tell you the actual SQL. So that was useful, and people used it for that, both for timing and for inspecting the the SQL string that was sent to the RDBMS. So it, it is a good feature for ORM to have to allow you to go under the covers, and a lot of them do uh, uh, if you know how to use them. Ruby on Rails and so on, they uh, enable a logger that will log to a specific uh, location where you can see the literal SQL, uh, and the developers should know how to use that. You have, you're next. Yeah, I have, an, I have another question uh, regarding application design. Um, I'm pretty clear about at what point uh, uh, or in what component I, I, I usually uh, escape my, my output to the uh, to the database, and it's usually in the data access layer right there when I aggregate and uh, compose my SQL queries. It's not so it's not so clear for me at what point you should do the whitelisting. You could do it in multiple places. You could do it you know further upstream right there when you when you basically process your raw input from the user. And then, you know, but you basically at this point, then you in introduce SQL you know, through the mapping at this point, and you, or you could do it further downstream in, in the uh, within the data access layer. But that would require you to pass basically the raw input from from get or form or whatever, all the way down there and do it there. So, uh, I I usually go by the you know rule of thumb there where where I, f I feel it's the right place to do this type of stuff. Which is in like in a middle sort of like business layer, I don't know, in lack of better terms. But uh, would you have any recommendation? What's in in your experience? What would be like the, the proper place to to handle handle the whitelisting? What's the proper place to do the whitelisting? Well, in object oriented design, I usually follow the rule that the the class that has all the information uh, with which to do the task gets the responsibility to do, to do that task. So if if it if a class is your domain model class, and it's going to be the one to invoke data access objects, um, either through their ORM layer to, to use a, a data gateway or an active record or something, or if it's running literal SQL, this this layer, the domain model layer, is where you're going to be doing that. Okay. And that's that's the uh, in in terms of the the layers of enterprise application architecture, that's where you would most likely have all the information that you need in order to do that whitelisting. I think of um, uh, application architecture as going from uh, controller, you know, in, in an MVC paradigm, you would go controller, service layer, domain model, data access component. And service layer would be the place where you'd manage transactions. Domain model is the place where you'd manage queries. Data access layer is where you'd execute the queries, but um, at a much more gra uh, fine-grained level. Uh, and each of those aggregate the lower-level objects up the chain. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, I think it does. It, it, it kind of reconfirms what what I've been trying to do. Yeah. Um, basically, one one layer above the actual data access layer. Um, yeah. That's because why the data access layer can be just execute this immediate query. I'm going to hand you a, a, a string, which I'm telling you is SQL. Please execute it for me. So the layer that is going to be invoking that operation is the layer that would be constructing that SQL string. Hence, it would have the information needed to do that, and that's the, probably the best place to do the, the uh, whitelisting. As opposed to some place up, further up the chain, which uh, may result in duplication of work, because now you'd have 
multiple service layers which, which would be accessing the same domain model. And if all of them are doing the whitelisting individually, now you, you have to implement that whitelisting in multiple places. It would be better to do it closer to the, uh, the query that's being formed. Okay, thank you. At the back. Get the microphone to you. Okay, hi. Uh, I think um, I have two comments. First for his question, and I think um, if I were him, I would do this. Uh, I would do this um, profiling right at the beginning because I don't want any crap to come inside my code. I mean, whenever I read it, I mean, it's just best to just keep him outside of the building because uh, I don't know, I mean, what else, like memory consumption or whatever. And second comment is about like uh, in your presentation, you pointed out developers after every five minutes. I think it's not developers, it's business units. Um, in one of my last projects, uh, my business unit says that we have to do coding from eight to five, and if we need to do um, any um, uh, security testing, it should be after five o'clock if we have time. So I mean, I don't know because they don't care if user you um, loses their data, you know. So just a comment. Okay. So security security testing only after five o'clock if we have time and you feel like staying late. Well, there's a great quote. Say if I remember the source of it. Security is not an add-on feature. Security should be part of the architecture and part of the, uh, uh, the, the, the quality process from start to finish. Uh, and what I, what I think of as quality assurance is something that begins with uh, design and uh, requirements even very, from the very beginning and finishes with quality control, which is what we conventionally think of as, as uh, quality assurance uh, or QA testing. But it, it involves doing the right thing, implementing it with best practices, and then finally confirming that it is there. And it has to be a holistic process for it to be truly quality, you know, from soup to nuts. So I think the security falls into that. Performance is probably another place where the, you know, it deserves to be treated at every layer of that. Uh, so your, your design should think about those aspects of the uh, measurable goals of the product uh, from the, the very beginning. And I would, I would say, you're doing it wrong if you if you only do security testing as as an afterthought. But that's not to say that that doesn't happen, and I respect that. I mean, it's uh, you know not every project is done uh, in a blue ribbon fashion, and you do your best uh, and make the uh, make the people who are in charge of the decisions and in charge of the budget aware of what it's going to take to assure strong security, well-tested and, and assurance, and say, uh, that's something that we have to consider as, as a business unit about what is our commitment to security and what is going to be our answer when the uh, security is uh, exploited uh, by someone and we lose 12 million credit card numbers as a result. One piece of advice I have with that is uh, I've come into that situation before where they just didn't care about security, and anytime something came up, they just kind of hacked something together and moved on, and it came up again. And the way I got it to kind of change was I started keeping track of how much time everybody spent fixing the security problems every time they popped up, and how much time we spent dealing with the consequences, how much money was lost doing that, and then that took that to the people and change their minds and when they realize how much it actually costs them in in time and money and hours to do it, not even counting a situation where, you know, public perception or actual, you know, credit card data being stolen, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's a good point. It's well documented in many locations and through many research that it's much cheaper to fix defects early in the process, in the in the design process and, and from the very beginning than it is to fix defects after the fact, after you've gone into production and, and you have to start uh, doing fire drills to uh, correct things and then redeploy code that has, in addition to the cleanup uh, required to, to uh, solve those situations and talk to law enforcement and compensate people and, and so on. 
Yeah, there's nothing like that letter from the Department of Justice giving you a cease and desist <laughs> for getting your yeah, stuff hacked. <laughs> okay, is there a question over here? That's getting to a slightly larger question about uh, is there a literature on you know measuring like the cost uh, of um, you know instituting certain practices to um, improve security compared to just sort of making it up ad hoc? Certainly, I mean there yeah. uh, is is there literature for, and research going on? Yes, uh, yeah. there has been for decades. Um, you know, and security is a large area of of, uh, in academia, of research. Uh, I haven't read extensively on that topic, but you know, certainly there are uh, whole companies devoted to it. Mm. Uh, just, just like companies like Percona devoted to performance, uh, there are companies that are devoted to inspecting code and mm -hmm. testing your uh, applications, both in an automated fashion and in uh, uh, manual inspections. You can hire specialists to do this and it often turns out to be a choice between hire a specialized firm to come in and, and evaluate code and, and give recommendations mm -hmm. versus do it the ad hoc way, as you mentioned, in an inexpert way with your developers who are not trained to look for those types of issues or invest a whole lot of time and money into training your team mm -hmm. to, to become security experts, uh, uh, which may not be the most economical thing to do. It, despite the, the cost of hiring specialists, you're only hiring them for a limited duration on the project, and it could be well worth your while to, uh, to bring in some experts to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, just for the same thing, so if you have like uh, X amount of money for your budget, as a budget, um, how much will you spend on your security in, uh, as a cautious uh, effort? Let's say 10%, 20%, or... 30% depending upon market uh, situation in general. I would. Uh, how much would you spend as a percentage of your total budget? I would hope uh, a, a fairly small amount. I mean, if you think about uh, the process of requirements gathering, might be 20 to 25% of your process, and then design would be 20 to 25% of your process, coding 20%, and then error removal uh, and debugging another. 30, 40% of the whole budget. Just doing code inspections and uh, quality control for security issues should be quite a bit less than 10% because you've got a lot of other things to think about. Maybe you also need to do usability testing. You need to do uh, localization. You need to do uh, uh, graphic design. You need to do uh, deployment automation. You, need, you have a, a you know, things. There, there are benchmarks for that. I mean, there are even non-technical aspects of the budget, marketing, uh, uh, IT, all these things. And you start adding all those up and, and uh, you start saying, well, really, we can't justify putting more than 9% into marketing and 4% into IT and 20% into uh, 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 debugging. So you really have to think of the whole pie. And, uh, and then the amount that you can devote to security testing, although it's an important uh, subject and, and you kind of can't do it wrong, you also can't justify devoting 40% of your total budget to it. it that would, just would not work. All right. Thanks very much for listening. Oh, now we got to do the raffle. Raffle. Now I'm going to put you to work. Uh, oh. 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 Oh.